Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular Continuing Medical Education Podcast. Join us each week to discuss the most pressing topics in cardiology and gain valuable insights that can be directly applied to your practice. Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Kopetsky, a preventive cardiologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Great pleasure today to be speaking with Dr. Amanda Bonikowski, who is the program director for our cardiac rehab program and assistant professor of medicine here at Mayo. Welcome, Mandy. Thank you, Dr. Kopetsky, for having me today. Pleasure to be here. Yes, oh, that's great. And we're talking about what I think one of the most exciting, uh, certainly, activity topics, which is high interval intensity training. Could you just give us a, a brief rundown of what is HIT or H-I-I-T, as it's called? Yeah, so high intensity interval training essentially is doing periods of higher intensity exercise and then followed by lower intensity exercise and doing that for you know a number of cycles throughout an exercise session. And is there any guidelines for doing it that you tell uh, your patients about? You know how hard to go, how long to rest in between, or you know slow down in between the intervals, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. The really neat and fun part about high intensity interval training is that it is infinitely variable. So it can be incorporated in whatever fashion you would like using whatever exercise modality you would like. You can even use body weight as your exercise modality. So the training is very variable. And then in regards to what I share with time frame, it can be anywhere from as low as 10 second intervals. Um, which would be more similar to like the Tabata type protocol where you're doing kind of all out high intensity for 10 seconds. But in general for health and fitness, anywhere between 30 to 120 second intervals. Um, and, and depending on the rest break that you need um, for that type of interval, you can, you can adjust your work to rest ratios. There are a few protocols. I already mentioned the Tabata protocol. The other fairly famous protocol is the Norwegian or Scandinavian protocol, which is the four by four. Now this protocol is, would be more volume matched to a typical moderate intensity continuous training exercise session where you're gonna end up with about 30 to 40 minutes of exercise. Um, and that type of, uh, or that protocol does include, you know, a higher intensity over a four minute time frame, which maybe isn't always achievable for everyone, um, but they do a very great job of getting their patients up to that point. But end of the day, it's whatever is going to be best for your training program. And especially if an individual is brand new to exercise, I would definitely recommend a shorter interval and fewer intervals during your exercise session. Very good. And then how long, you said uh, how much rest they need. How do you know when they've had enough rest? So I would recommend an individual using uh, the rating of perceived exertion scale by, uh, uh, by Borg. And so, once they feel like they've somewhat recovered, they're no longer breathing hard, and they feel like their reading of perceived exertion is down around 11 or so, um, then they can you know, go back to another interval. It's best to give yourself a longer rest initially, um, and then gauge from there if you feel like you can shorten the rest. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes as we prescribe interval training programs, we will then change the rest to work ratio where we start to reduce the resting mm -hmm. ratio. As they get in better shape, they don't need as much rest Correct. to go just as hard the next time. Yep. Gotcha. So what are the advantages of HIT? I mean, do you get do you get more fit than with moderate intensity exercise? Absolutely. The number one advantage is yes, your peak VO2, our gold standard for how we measure cardiorespiratory fitness, it absolutely is a more potent stimulus for increasing your peak VO2 in a much shorter period of time compared to moderate intensity continuous training. So that's the number one benefit. And how we can then equate that benefit is that um, as we increase our peak VO2, um, we then see associated reductions in mortality, both all-cause all mortality and cardiac-related mortality. Fantastic. And what about uh, getting rid of body fat? Is it better than moderate intensity? It's kind of a trick question because nutrition is actually the best approach for getting rid of body <laughs> fat. Figured you'd like that one. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the literature is a little bit mixed. What the literature shows in general is that moderate intensity is probably a little bit better at getting rid of body fat per se. Um, however, there are a fair number of uh, interval training studies that have shown reductions in fat-free mass and body composition changes. And I think really the fat-free mass might be the, um, the marker, the stronger marker of health as we move forward and look into the literature more versus a focus on body fat alone. 
Does it seem more effective at getting rid of abdominal fat, every American's dream? So I don't think we can spot train, <laughs> um, but yeah. I, I think over time, it would be just as effective as moderate intensity continuous training. Um, so any, any type of training over a long period of time will definitely work to reduce, um, reduce that fat. Okay. Well, that, that really is exciting, uh, this, this intensity. What, uh, how can you get your patients to incorporate it into their daily activity? Is that possible? Do they have to go to a gym to do this? So there was a really neat study, and, and it's actually a book. Um, his name is Dr. Martin Gabala, and he, uh, he wrote the One Minute Workout. And so absolutely, here at the Mayo Clinic, we have steps galore. So what you can do is you can head out to one of the stairwells, and you can do 20 seconds of um, stair climbing three times a day. Um, and do that three times per week. And absolutely, he demonstrated that you still get the same or similar physiologic adaptations as you would to doing typical moderate intensity continuous training. And in that study, he suggested like three steps per second, so a fairly good pace? A pretty good pace, yes, going up those steps. Um, but some of his other studies also were more, um, more low volume. Um, and there's also a, an additional study by, I believe, Chin and colleagues that suggested even one session of HIT in a week, get similar adaptations to typical moderate intensity continuous training, which I think really gets at that, especially for a sedentary individual, anything helps. Mm -hmm. Any little bit will, will make a difference and will make an impact. And the literature also shows us that those individuals have the greatest gains, obviously because they have the most to gain, um, but even that one session of interval training or even if they don't do the steps at the exact pace that was done in the study, they're still gonna see significant benefits going from sedentary to even low to moderate, moderately active. Mm. Now, what is the physiology? I mean, you, you understand this physiology, so talk to us in terms we can understand, but uh, what's the physiology behind HIT? Why is it different than moderate intensity to get you in better shape? You know, that is a loaded question. <laughs> Um, but I think part of it is that one, you know, I think the heart is good at doing hard work. Um, so in the short term, it adjusts really well to that type of training. Um, you know, there are studies that show positive remodeling of the, the heart while we're, while we're doing high intensity interval training. Um, but I think also on top of that, individuals are increasing their muscle mass to a greater extent than simply going out for long, slow duration type activity. Um, and we see other, you know, vascular remodeling, improvements in blood flow. Um, and I think the other big thing is that um, individuals enjoy it. So there's a high perception of enjoyment, which is probably greatly related to the time efficient manner when individuals pick a shorter duration mm -hmm. of exercise. To be done with your exercise session in 20 minutes or less is, is far more enjoyable for some people while others, of course, enjoy longer bouts of exercise. Yes, oh, that, that's uh, wonderful, that's so true. So it, it conquers boredom. It, it does, yeah. I think. That's good. What does it do to lipids? Does it, is it more effective at lowering triglycerides or raising HDL? So both of those, that's a great point, yeah. So it's been shown to raise HDL, um, but then also shown to reduce triglycerides with regular exercise or regular um, interval training. Now, not so much impact on um, the LDLs, um, but that being said, if you do this long enough and you lose body weight, then you will likely lower your LDLs, which mm -hmm. that's generally the most potent uh, way to reduce LDLs. Great. What about blood pressure? Is it more effective at vasodilatation and causing drops in blood pressure long term? Yes, it has also been shown to reduce um, both systolic and diastolic blood pressure um, over the short term. Nobody's really done any long-term um, randomized controlled trials of resistance training versus moderate intensity continuous training. So many of the studies have been shorter term, um, but yes, they do show beneficial effects, which relates to some of that vascular remodeling, if you will, that helps to reduce the blood pressure. And when you say short term, what uh, was that, like six weeks, three months? Uh, that's probably a good range, yeah. Most of them are probably around the six to 12 week range which is typical mm -hmm. for a physical activity intervention study. Mm -hmm. um, but about over that six to 12 week time frame, you see those reductions. And is it safe? It is. Um, so again, it's infinitely variable. So even in individuals that maybe have some comorbid conditions that we would need to consider or underlying conditions, um, at this point, uh, the literature has shown that even in say like cardiac rehab patients, uh, those that have measured um, or looked for adverse events, event rates are very low. And in, even in a few of the studies, the event rates were lower in the patients performing HIT 
than the patients performing moderate intensity continuous training. Um, and then there hasn't been a ton of literature on um, more of the low intensity, low volume, um, but there, there has been a study on by Karstoft and colleagues. It was a low intensity interval free living walking program. Um, and within that program, that I think they really outlined something that just about anybody could do. Go outside, mm -hmm. go do intervals while you're walking, um, and it's likely going to be safe for just about anyone. Absolutely, the kind of the similar contraindications would exist to you know if you're going to do a maximal exercise test or something. There's some very extreme like severe symptomatic aortic stenosis or something along those lines that you know it's probably not safe for. Um, but for the general people, mm -hmm. the general population, we've seen it done in heart failure, in heart transplant, in coronary artery disease, metabolic dysregulation, um, and then of course in healthy individuals. So I think across the board, it's 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 quite safe. Good. Well, Dr. Bonikowski, this has been a wonderful discussion. So you pointed out first that interval high intensity interval training is better at getting you in, in fit. It raises your HDL more, lowers your triglycerides more, vasodilates you, lowers your blood pressure. I mean, it's something we all need to do a little more of. Dr. Bonikowski, thank you for joining us today. It was great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us today. Feel free to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast by emailing cvselfstudy at mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular CME podcast on your favorite platform and tune in each week to explore today's most pressing cardiology topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic.